Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Now I Know. I want to first start off by saying thank you so much for the likes, the supports, and the follows, and most of all, the questions and the comments. This is really what I want from all this channel is to open a doorway of interaction between all of us that had this one goal to follow our dreams, to follow our residencies, and I know how tough of it of a path it is, especially in the beginning, especially when you're reading something and not really hearing about it, interacting with people about it to get really through the gist of all that you need to get where you need to be. In short, I love that you're all interacting. Please continue to do so. This is what drives this channel. This is where it was born from. And be sure to interact on on the Facebook uh, Now I Know community page so all of, all of you can see each other's questions and you can share pictures there, like articles, books, whatever things that you think might help each other with. We can all talk about it over there. Now, today's video is a Q&A session. And I like these videos because as well, it's the closest thing to a live session where we all get to talk with one another, <laughs> simply put. And I, I wish I could choose all the, the comments, but I chose the most ones that seem to be um, the most repeated and, and relevant to what everyone could benefit from. So we're gonna start with the first one. Uh, on a positive note, we're starting with Caleb's comment. Uh, he's saying, could you please give some information on the day versus night shifts comparison? For example, stress, pay, and activities. So uh, night shifts, like everywhere around the world, they could be very calm, very easygoing, or very hectic and long night where you don't get any sleep. It all depends on the type of specialty that you're doing. So in Sweden, for example, uh, in my field of ophthalmology, uh, we get in my particular hospital one night shift a month. And that night shift is quite um, a, a different one uh, than what you usually have in internal medicine, for example. In our profession, <clears throat> your, your shift starts between uh, 5 p.m. once your day shift ends till 8 p.m. the same night where you're in the hospital, the clinic is currently open, and then the doors close, you go home, and your night shift from home starts. You start receiving calls, and the calls are from either uh, hospitals, from emergency centers, from different clinics, um, from the ER, whatever it might be, and you get to um, give them some advice on how to take care of that particular situation and in some circumstances you have to go into the hospital and see it so it can be a calm night it can be a stressful night it all varies in internal medicine from what i know from my colleagues that have worked in it so um, you can get it at one or two weeks at a time where you take the night shift and then it switches over to the other time around usually you do get a, a breather after a long night shift in internal medicine and other, other fields in ophthalmology, you continue to work the next day. Um, when it comes to um, act like pay and activities, of course, uh, pay is directly linked to how much you actually work during these, these night shifts. But doctors do get very well compensated for their night work and their extra work, especially if you end up taking a night shift from someone else because they were sick. So an urgent night shift where you might get double the pay and double the time compensated. So uh, in Sweden, we have something called hur comp, which basically means that uh, for uh, for the time that you spend taking on that night shift, you get both uh, money and you get time. So vacation time afterwards, time which you can convert to money if you'd like. So the general rule here is 30% pay, 70% time. That's how it usually goes. Let's take the next one. Very good question, Caleb. So this one is from Sayuni Dinange. The question is this, do we need to complete the language Swedish course before applying to the university? Or can we enter the university with a Cambridge AI results and eyelids? Right, so um, Sayuni, so the thing is like this, when applying to get your license, your Swedish medical license, one of the requirements of the social status or the board that is the approval committee, basically, for you to become a licensed physician in Sweden, they require as a prerequisite that you have a C1 level of language proficiency level. Now, there are many ways where people can get it, either through a, going through a language course and doing the C1 exam, 
or there are or you can go through a university course and be accredited after finishing that university language course um, that you're fluent enough in Sweden in Swedish in, in order to continue uh, with your with your uh, uh, with your career so what I suggest you do when it comes to uh, to asking about university degree versus a language center degree is to simply email the social citizen and ask them in particular about that question what kind of university degrees do you want from that um, when it comes to the islets so the English proficiency degree is not a prerequisite here per se uh, if you want to continue your residency in Sweden because this the residency is in Swedish and medicine is practiced here in Swedish yeah so I recommend you you ask them that particular question if you're interested in knowing that one all right we have a question from Sarah Greener I was wondering what life is if you go into a general medicine specialty like cardiology or a specialty like pediatrics What's the work-life balance like when you need to do on-site calls in busy specialties? All right. So um, I have several colleagues that are in these different fields. One is in pulmonology, the other is in uh, emergency medicine, and um, the other is in family medicine. And one of my best friends is in cardiology, in fact. And it can be very stressful. And it can be very calm. In Sweden, usual things are very well managed time-wise in a fashion where you don't get to be super overworked during the work week, or that that's supposedly the plan. Uh, it's a 46 to 48 hour work week that can vary depending on sick leaves, extra calls, and depending on how much you wanna work. Um, you get enough time for yourself. You get enough time to relax, you get enough time for your mental sanity and in Sweden something that is very well appreciated if you start to experience symptoms of burnout syndrome here it's taken very seriously you can request a time off through your family physician because of having these symptoms these experiences because of being too tired or if you feel that you're overworked so they really look at these different kind of changes that a doctor experiences and they really um invest a lot in can keeping that environment up between uh, a doctor's work life and their personal life sort of two separate and sacred environments so it's something that you're going to discover throughout different specialties different hospitals different departments and you're going to find that work balance but they really do work with you because it's part of their ethics the part of their mentality and how they function in a way that they don't want you to overwork yourself to death because they know that your mental capacity and your performance dips immediately the moment that you start feeling overwhelmed and stressed so it's something you can voice and and you can you can talk about openly and you'll be very very well received hope that answers your question okay Let's continue. So we have a question from Mariam Mahmoudi. She's asking, um, how competitive is a dermatology residency and how can you look up the number of residency per years? So that's a very good question. Um, dermatology, like uh, plastic surgery, radiology, anesthesia, all these different specialties that are quite competitive all over the world. They're as well competitive here in Sweden, but something that we talked about previously. The way that things work here is that sometimes when you're in the right place at the right time, after you've had all your paperwork done, after you've gotten your license, after you've gone through your language courses, when everything is all said and done, your opportunities can either be available for you to apply to them, or they can be created by you asking for them. So what I usually recommend is that when you already know what you want, start talking to departments emailing them asking whenever you know like slots they have open for you to apply if they have any opportunities that you can go and do some rotations there to assist to do research with them whatever it might be that they need and sometimes they might be in short of a doctor someone went on a sick leave someone went on a parental leave uh, a, a doctor left their job whatever it might be that you might be applying at that right time when they are looking for someone just as passionate, someone that just knows what they want just as much as you do. 
and and things can start from that perspective of course the more experience you have the better it is and when i say experience in sweden there are two types of experiences we have to talk about one is your experience in the general healthcare sector of sweden basically working in internal medicine doing an internship like the at or bt that we talked about or working in family medicine or another field in the medical field in sweden before you apply to these residencies this is always a plus because it's very good for them to know that you're familiar with their medical system instead of you just being casted out into their department just from the very beginning but in fact it does happen that sometimes uh, people that have just you know been certified gotten their medical license without prior experience they might get accepted into their specialty right on if and when you're applying the right place at the right time it's hard for you to know when that time is so that's why you have to keep trying and keep in contact with them be on their radar email them keep in contact with their different schedules whenever you know just tell them that whenever a spot opens up please have me in mind all right let's continue we have a question from uh, akshay he's asking how would you advise someone to learn the scientific and medical terms in another language i don't think it'll be too difficult to get the c1 but it seems quite hard to learn all the medical swedish equivalents um Okay, so that's a very good question. You see, when you're learning the language from the very beginning, of course you're not going to be starting to learn about the medical terminologies and the, the conversions between the Latin language and how they use the terminology in Swedish. But after you finish at least your B1, certain programs like the one in Folk or others, and especially like the one in the Settlement to Stockholm Institute, I'm not advertising them, but something that I know from my experience and the people that have done it, is that they tailor their Swedish language after you finish your B1 and B2, they tailor the content that they present to you, the articles that they ask you to read, your homework to medical Swedish. And let me tell you this straight so that you have it in your mind. When you, f when you finish your C1, when you start working from day one in any medical field in Swedish, you're gonna learn a ton, a ton of um, medical words in the Swedish language from patient charts from the books that they recommend because i'm saying they have usually they, they do study in in in, in american international and european textbooks but as well they have their own shortened down versions of it in swedish so they're going to advise you in your department what kind of material to read what kind of references that's as well in swedish so soon enough within a short period of time you're going to start building up your um swedish medical language terminology in that field that is for you i don't i don't want you to worry about that right now focus mo mostly on applying your language skills building up your knowledge in language and the basic foundations of language and these words you're going to pick up over time i guarantee you that's a very good question thank you for asking that this might be a bit of a longer video than the others bear with me because there are a lot of nice questions and i'm going to try to answer the most relevant ones that would benefit everyone so we have a question here by ace it says if the medical student is an eu citizen but they graduated from an internationally accredited medical school that is outside the eu how is he or she being evaluated very good question ace this is something i want you guys to know it doesn't matter what your nationality is as much as it matters where you graduated from whether it's inside the eu or outside the eu so simply put if the university was outside the eu even if it's internationally accredited thus you follow the non-eu pathway and i put the link like always down below check the video out for the non-eu pathway so we see how how the evaluation goes and what steps you need to take the second question that ace asked is do you think being an md phd graduate would increase the chances of getting accepted in the residency program in sweden let me say it this way absolutely the more degrees that you have the more like beefed up your cv is the more attractive you are as an applicant but the number one thing that really defines or increases your chances of being accepted in residency here in sweden is prior work experience in the swedish medical field um recommendations by your peers and bosses and that's very good that's very important of course and the third thing is your language skills how well you communicate during your interview and simply put what and what and how you speak during your interview so these all play in part to them giving you a chance and you presenting them with a very good first impression 
So these are the very like, I would say cornerstones of, of your application. So language, what you say, your prior work experience, what, what your colleagues say about you, and other things that you've done on, on your CV, such as research, whether you have a PhD or something else. Plus, they're very, of course, they're very interested here knowing that you're interested in research, especially if you're applying to university hospital. Okay, uh, we're gonna take, uh, let's see, we're gonna take uh, two more questions. Uh, this one is by Andromeda Galaxy, love the name. What is the total cost of getting a Swedish residency and how long does it take? So I'm gonna dedicate a special video just about the cost of the Swedish residency and up to getting into the Swedish residency and how long it takes. But in short, we're gonna say it like this. When you start your residency, you're gonna be earning money. When you're gonna be doing your internship, you are going to be earning money. You're not gonna be paying out of pocket to do that. Your main costs are gonna be from the very beginning while you're learning language. Language courses, rent, and living expenses. These are the main ones. We're gonna be talking more in, the separ in a separate video about the average amount of money that you're gonna be thinking about to spend during that time, depending on whether you take uh, distance language courses or you are in the country. Um, so stay tuned for that. It's, it's gonna be coming up after the, the, the Swedish versus American residency comparison videos. We're taking the last question now, That's it's by Amir. I'd like to know how easy or difficult it is for a new medical graduate with no work experience to get a residency in Sweden. So Amir, I'm gonna connect this question back to something we talked about in a previous question right now. So the ease and difficulty are really uh, determined by how you present yourself during an interview, your language skills, and your research interests. So, and what they need as a department from someone, what they need. Sometimes they need a new doctor that has no prior work experience. Some hospitals are particularly looking for someone with no prior residency or work experience so that they teach you fresh, how they want you to learn, like with, as a blank slate. So it's really that sort of scenario where you have to just put yourself out there, present yourself to everyone and see who is interested in that particular criteria of degree that you have and work experience that you have you never know life is all full of doors guys i hope you enjoyed this video i'm so happy to see this interaction you're always more than welcome to contact me either through instagram or by commenting of course on youtube please share and like these videos share so other people can know about it other people that are maybe searching online thinking of asking someone in question maybe they don't have anyone that is particularly here in sweden this is not just about me or this channel, it's a community, we're all helping each other and this is really what makes me happy because I went through this as I was starting my path, um, which can be scary, which can be exciting, but most of all, it's worth it if you really want it. Thank you for joining me for this video, catch you in the next one, stay tuned, peace.